Good morning, FBC. My name is Mark Westman, but you're probably more familiar with my much better looking and more talented wife, Rebecca, who regularly sings on stage. Before beginning, I would just like to take a moment to express my gratitude to the individuals who have participated in and made the streaming of Sunday services possible. It has been a tremendous encouragement to stay connected to FBC during the pandemic. Today, Pastor Doug will be preaching from Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20, as we are entering the home stretch of our Jesus' Greatest Tweets series. It can be easy to forget that while we have been covering the Sermon on the Mount for a few months, Jesus taught this whole section of scripture within a single day. He outlined a standard that was at the heart of the law and was a radical departure from the expected practice within Jewish society. This series has challenged me to examine my own life in light of God's standard and what he calls his followers to. As Pastor Ryan preached last week, Jesus tells us that we can only enter God's kingdom through a narrow gate and that the gateway is small and the road is narrow and only a few ever find it. I'm encouraged in knowing that it is not about simply trying harder, but that as I surrender my will, Christ takes up greater residence in my life and his life will be exemplified through me. Given that the road to life is narrow and only a few ever find it, we must be all the more aware of the detours that falsely promise to get us there much quicker and with greater ease. Earlier in this message, Jesus stated that everyone who seeks finds, and this requires us to put our faith into action and really trust God. The road to life, if we choose to follow Jesus, will not always seem logical from our human perspective. It may even cause us to question if we are going the right way or if God is leading us at all. This becomes the great test as to whether we will trust him and his word over all else. Knowing the truth enables us to align our life with Christ's and identify messages that are inconsistent with his. All of us have seen hazard symbols or warning signs on certain items or in specific locations. Usually they have standardized features that make them easy to identify and include a pictogram that makes the message easy to decipher. The yellow triangle or diamond with the black border immediately lets you know, hey, pay attention. If you tip this vending machine trying to shake your Mars bar loose, it could fall and crush you. The purpose of these symbols is to communicate a message to be alert, on guard and proceed with caution. The part of the Sermon on the Mount we arrive at today could perhaps have its own warning symbol. Yellow triangle, black border, black pictogram showing a wolf holding a sheep costume. Verse 15 starts with, beware, or in other translations, watch out. So immediately we should be picking up that there exists a danger that poses a very real threat. And if the warning is not heeded, then the consequences could be dire. Matthew 7 verses 15 and 16 say this, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? We see that verse 15 provides the explicit warning that hinges on someone appearing to be harmless, but they are in fact a destructive force. Jesus tells us that we can detect them, referring to false prophets, by the way they act, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit. The way a person acts or lives their life will indicate who they really are. Jesus does not mince words here. The fruit indicates the type of plant. This means that an individual's actions will reflect whether they belong to Jesus or not. Now, while this warning is given regarding detecting false prophets, Jesus had just recently been speaking about the speck in the log. Therefore, it is important that we don't miss reflecting and examining our own lives with these verses. Verses 17 to 20 serve as an allegory because they are symbolic representations for people. Jesus goes on to say, a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, 
so you can identify people by their actions. So the question you and I must wrestle with and reflect on regularly is this, do our lives reveal Jesus? It is not enough to simply say that we are Christians or followers of Christ. Our lives are to be the conduit for Jesus to reveal his character in the world. If you want to identify the tree, then look at the fruit. If you want to identify the person, then look at the way they live. If we have made a personal decision to follow Jesus, we must repeatedly come back to this question. What fruit is my life producing? Our Father everlasting, 
the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection when we will rise again. For I believe in the our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is everybody. Uh, excited to have you with us again this morning. And you can see uh, from the view behind me that we're coming to you from the FBC Kids area where we've moved the band in and uh, the guys are doing all the filming in here. It makes it a little bit easier to social distance and gives the band some room to, to uh, spread out and, and so on. So uh, that's the backdrop this morning. And again, just want to send a shout out to all the guys that are doing the, the videoing and, and the worship teams that are doing the music. Just appreciate so much everything that they're doing for us and the way that they're enabling us to bring these uh, services to you on online. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, hey, I don't know about how you're doing, but I'm excited. Uh, I'm actually uh, really excited. I lost 10 pounds last week. 
And uh, that's the good news, I guess. The bad news is that it didn't come from around here. Uh, it all came from up here. I got a haircut. And uh, 10 pounds, you know, that's as much as I guess they could muster. But I'm excited to have that gone. And, and uh, another thing I'm enthused about is I'm enthused about uh, where we're going today in the message. Um, we're coming into the, the landing on this um, Jesus' Greatest Tweets series that we've been doing as we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this passage that we're going uh, to be talking about this morning is, is, is really cool. Um, we can see here as Jesus is bringing it in for a landing, as he's bringing in the message for a landing, uh, he's been talking about the kingdom of God and, and what reality is like according to God. And now he's starting to serve the ball back into our court, if you will, and he's leaving us with some decisions to make. And so we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20 this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me. If not, uh, the video guys are good to have the, the words on the screen so you can follow along there. So let's just turn to that now. Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by, your, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Before we go any further, let's just stop and pray and ask God to open up his word to us this morning. Father, this morning we stop and we say thank you for your word. Thank you that you came and that you are opening up the reality of the kingdom of God to us. And I pray that as we look at this passage this morning, that you would speak to us, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive so that we could learn from you today, that we could apply these things to our lives uh, and that we would become more and more your people, uh, a greater testimony to the world around us. And we ask this all now in Christ's name and for his sake alone. Amen. All right. So you'll see that this morning we're talking about false prophets. And as per usual, Jesus gets right to it. Have you ever seen anybody that can say so much with so few words? I can't believe how much that Jesus can communicate in such a few short sentences. But that's always the case. He never wastes words. And here we see it again. He gets right to the point with a warning right off the hop. Watch out for false prophets. Now, can I ask a question? When was the last time that you were consciously thinking about watching out for false prophets? Maybe as you come to this section today, you think about it in sort of historical terms and you think to yourself, well, this is something that was in the context of Jesus' day. It doesn't really apply to us anymore. This applied to when there were prophets, we, there had to be prophets in order for there to be false prophets. And so maybe you think about this passage and you think it's re really not an issue for us anymore. But unfortunately, it still is an issue. All around us, there are people that are misrepresenting God to us day by day. They're out to garner our attention and they're actually trying to get us to subscribe to their false perspectives and opinions. So this wasn't just a problem in Jesus' day. It's still an issue for you and I as we live now. And chances are then, we're going to run into a false prophet somewhere in the course of our lives, somewhere uh, as we're navigating through life, either on television or we'll uh, run into them surfing the net. Maybe it'll be in the books we read. But somewhere, someone is going to be out there trying to sell us a perspective that is wrong, that's false. It might even be a friend or a family member. But somewhere, someone is up to that and trying to enlist us and get us to subscribe to what they have to say. And it's all wrong. So Jesus throws out a warning for us. Be on guard. Watch out for these false prophets. But that's not the end of it. Not only should we expect then to encounter false prophets, but Jesus goes on to say that they're devious and deceitful. They're coming to us dressed as sheep, he says. And he tells us that in order to, for us to understand that they're trying to appear harmless. They're setting themselves up to be 
benign uh, and to garner our support or to enlist our trust. And they go to great lengths to accomplish that. Now, this speaks of intent. The fact that someone is purposefully out there working against us. Nowadays, it's not popular to talk about the idea of Satan or uh, the fact that there is an evil force at work in the world around us trying to deceive us. Society writes that off as archaic or as old wives' tales uh, or maybe even as primitive control tactics that the church uses to control the simple-minded. But scripture actually tells us that this is the case. And if you're like me, I need to be reminded that we have an adversary out there who is working towards his own ends. And that in that objective of his, that we serve as, as targets uh, and as the means to those ends. And so therefore, if he can get someone that can um, give, a, give us a false message or get us to buy into a false perspective, well then he succeeds in his purposes. I think that we tend to go through life less than on guard, if you will. We get busy doing life, and we forget to be watching out for danger. So Jesus comes along and he says, hey, be watching out for these guys because they're out there. They're deceptive and they're devious. They're tricky. So keep your wits about you. And moreover, they're also dangerous. They're not out just to make us look silly but they are out to harm us. They're dangerous. Jesus says they're like ferocious wolves. And remember here that ferocious doesn't just mean big and scary looking. Actually, if you look it up, it means that they are savagely fierce or even better, that they are violently cruel. So they're out to bring harm to those that succumb to their false ideas and perspectives. And, and they just don't care. They are in it for their own purposes and ends. And whoever they harm in that is of no consequence to them. So Jesus says, don't be lulled into complacency. Now, it is great that Jesus brings this to our attention. You know, that we need to be looking out for the problem of false prophets. It's nice to know and it's helpful to know that a problem exists. But Jesus goes on and does us the added favor of telling us how we can actually identify these false prophets. He points out that the way to identify them is by their fruit. Now, despite their disguises and deceitfulness, their fruit will identify them. So to both emphasize and explain his point, Jesus turns to the example of plants. Let's pick it up again at the end of verse 16. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. So in essence then, what Jesus is saying is that a false prophet can't disguise themselves forever. They can disguise themselves for a while maybe, but not forever. What's inside eventually comes to the surface. So no matter what disguise they put on over top, what's underneath will eventually percolate its way to the top and become evident for us to see. The bottom line then is that good trees produce good fruit and bad trees produce bad fruit, no exceptions. Now, note that trees only produce their fruit in the proper season. So that's to say then that sometimes we have to wait a while before that fruit becomes evident. We have to wait until that fruit comes into season for us to be able then to gauge what kind of fruit it is. So we have to stay diligent then and keep on evaluating. We can't rest. And it's definitely not a scenario where we can just take one snapshot, make a decision and be done. You know, my grandfather 
used to drill into my head over and over growing up that I needed to question everything. Question everything and question everyone. Never take anything at f face value. Always do the math. And I have to say that I was young then and didn't understand it, but now as I look back, it has really served me well. And as I come to this passage, it reminds me of him. We have to just be diligent and questioning everything, always evaluating what kind of fruit it is that we're seeing in front of us. So in summary then, the basic premise of this passage is to watch out for false prophets. They're tricky and they're deceitful and they're dangerous. And the way that we identify them then is by their fruit. However, this begs further questions and some thoughts that I want to pursue a little bit further today. And so let's dig into them a little bit more. First of all, it begs the question of what kind of fruit that we should be looking for. How do we identify those false prophets? What fruit do they produce? And with that question in mind, then I think that we should be watching for two things. Number one, we need to be watching how they live, how the teachers around us and preachers around us live. Secondly, we need to be evaluating and watching what they say. Now, in terms of how they live, ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, do they exhibit the fruits of the Spirit? You've heard it before. One of the best ways to identify a counterfeit is by making sure that you know the real thing. So if we know the fruits of the Spirit, well, then we know that much better and that much quicker when someone comes along and demonstrates fruit that isn't fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 tell us the fruits of the Spirit. There it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. So those are the good fruit. We should be watching for, the, for those in our preachers and teachers. And if they exhibit them, then great. But if they don't, or if they don't exhibit these things consistently over time, then there's bad fruit, and you might well be dealing with a false prophet. Now, with regard to what they say, well, there's lots of things that could be said about that. Lots of things to consider there. But this morning, let me point out four quick things to watch for. Number one almost goes without saying. Does what they say contradict Jesus? If that's the case, well, that's pretty simple. That's a non-starter right off the hop. If anyone is contradicting Jesus, well, they are a false prophet, and that's a false perspective, and we need to deal with them accordingly. Secondly, do they present a simple gospel message? Now, the fact is, is that salvation rests with Jesus Christ alone. We've got to always remember that and never forget it. We are sinful people. And the consequence of sin is death. Therefore, God sent Jesus, who lived a sinless life and then died on the cross in order to pay the penalty of our sin. He then rose from the grave after three days, thereby conquering death, so that then all who would place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ alone and repent from their sin and follow him, will be saved. Anyone that adds to that or subtracts from that is misrepresenting God and is therefore a false prophet. If anybody tries to sell you the idea that you need Jesus and works, or that you need to have Jesus and pay for your salvation, it's garbage. Toss it out. They're a false prophet. Number three, ask yourself this question. Do they lead others to benefit themselves? Or do they lead people to follow themselves more than they lead people to follow Jesus? 1 Timothy 6 verses 3 to 5 say, says this. 
Paul writes, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in the controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Paul follows it up in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, where he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from our own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. If someone is exploiting faith, exploiting the gospel, in order to benefit themselves, they are false prophets. Lastly, number four, do they water down the gospel? Do they preach that the road that leads to life isn't narrow at all, that it's broad, that we can do virtually whatever we want and that road's still going to take us to heaven? Or do they teach that all roads lead to, to God, that everything, everyone gets us there in the end? Or do they present the idea that there is no judgment from God, that he's all love and that's it? Well, listen to what God has to say about that himself as he speaks about false prophets back in Jeremiah's day. In Jeremiah 23, verses 16 and 17, God says this, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you, they fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. And then in, a little earlier in Jeremiah 8 verse 11, God says this, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. The fact is, is that unless we deal with the problem of sin, we remain an enemy of God. And one day we will be judged for that. So if someone denies God as judge, if they preach him as just love without justice, well then, they're a false prophet. And this brings us to the next consideration from our passage for today. Why is Jesus so concerned about false prophets? Now, I think that when we come to this passage, we often consider it primarily in terms of the false prophet. Jesus says that they're out there, so we agree. And he says that they're devious and dangerous. And so we accept that. And then he says that we'll know them by their fruit. So we do the math. And we think to ourselves, well, then they're bad trees. If they're producing bad trees, then uh, bad fruit, then they're bad trees. And so then we get to verse 19. And Jesus says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. And so at that point, we look at that and think, well, that settles it. It serves them right. They're getting what they deserve. So done deal. But I think what we miss is that while Jesus is indeed talking about false prophets, he is talking to you and I. So the point here is not as much about telling us um, what's going to happen to the false prophet, but rather, Jesus is concerned about what's going to happen to those of us that succumb to their misrepresentations of who God is and the, the truth. Because the fate of the false prophet is also the fate of those that are diverted away from the truth. 
the consequence for the follower of the false prophet is exactly the same as the consequence for the false prophet themselves. They are thrown into the fire. They miss the kingdom of God. So we need to hear Jesus this morning as he's telling us uh, to watch out for false prophets and not come away with the idea that, whoa, I'm sure glad I'm not one of them, but rather, whoa, I better be careful so that I'm not buying into one of them. We're not going to have the option one day of saying, well, I just didn't understand because they were teaching the wrong thing. I just didn't get it because of him or her. Jesus is telling us that we are responsible for ourselves, so we better watch out. Now Paul backs this up and tells us the same thing. Let's go back to Acts chapter 20, but this time let's look at verses 29 and 30 and then also at verse 31. I know that after I leave, Paul writes, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from our own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. The bottom line is the buck stops with you and me. So we better be on our game. Now, as we look at this passage and hear from Jesus about false prophets, understand this. This is a real warning from Jesus because there is a real threat. And this, there's a real threat because there is a real consequence. Now, a few quick last thoughts worth noting here before we wrap it up for today. Note what is implied in this passage as Jesus talks to us about false prophets. As Jesus talks about false prophets, the implication is then that there is objective truth. Otherwise, we couldn't declare something as false. Truth is not relative. So don't buy into this idea of her truth or their truth or my truth that everyone's talking about nowadays. Blah, blah, blah. When it comes to the truth, there is only the truth. And he is Jesus Christ. And by him, we know what is true and what is false. Lastly, also, we see here that Jesus' teaching disqualifies some ideas, such as pluralism, which is the position that salvation can come through a bunch of different religious options, or the idea of universalism, which is the position that everyone will end up one day in heaven, or syncretism, which is the study that uh, tries to attempt to reconcile or somehow harmonize um, conflicting or opposing doctrines. If anybody comes to you advocating for one of those positions, well then this is another passage that you can bring them to and point out that Jesus isn't buying it and neither are you. So this morning as we look at this passage, we can see that Jesus tells us an awful lot in these few verses. He covers a lot of ground and he's given us a lot to consider. The question that I'll leave you with this morning is, who are you going to listen to? Let's pray. Father, this morning again, God, thank you that by your word we can know the truth. And Lord, that by knowing the truth that we can look forward then one day to having eternity to share with you. Lord, that we can find salvation through your son, Jesus Christ as he presents to us your reality and your truth. So this morning as we consider this, God, I pray that you would be with each of us, that you would help us to have, again, ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive, that we would accept Jesus and his teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount, and that we would now be making the decision 
to place our trust in him, to follow him. And so to that end, would you work by your spirit in our, in our hearts and our minds, be with those uh, with whom, or for whom this, this message is new. I pray that, uh, again, that it would ring true, that, that they would just recognize the truth of it, that they would know you for what you, who you are, and, and, and this is the truth that you're communicating to us, and that they would respond to that. I pray also that for those of us that do know you, that we would continue to be on guard, that we would be watching carefully, that we would be doing our best to make sure that we don't succumb to any of the false teachings out there, that we would uh, remain dedicated to you and following you, that you would get us into your word, that you would help us to uh, recognize you more and more day by day. And, and as we do that, that we would be able to also then perceive and understand uh, false teaching and preaching as, as it's presented uh, to us and around us. And so uh, to that end, again, bless us, um, grow us as your people. And I pray all of this now in Christ's name, amen. Have a really good week. And don't forget to tune in next week as Ryan's back to talk to us about true and false disciples. We'll see you then.